Section 4, The Critic as Artist A winter aura enchanted the room. One that could freeze the shortest of conversations, one that could ice even the longest of them. A dialogue had been frozen solid, requiring the participants that they arrest. The only way for them to continue, which would solely be beneficial for you, was to shatter the ice. It was raining outside, not snowing, oddly enough. It wouldn't have been an exaggeration to say this had only heightened the dramatic tension between the two of them. The two of them being the two particularly opinionated individuals we had been observing all this time, the critic and the artist. They had been fumbling around on two opposite sides of the one-room apartment they live in together. The critic, currently suffering from a headache with a small doses of one existential crisis, was sitting in the lower bunk of a two-floored bed where she usually takes rest every 72 hours or so, give or take, when she doesn't have a deadline right up to her neck. Ordinarily, right now would have been the time to take such rest, if not for the fact that her recent conversation with the artist had made her feel too uneasy to focus on sleeping. The artist was being quite happy-go-lucky as she always seems to be. It is an, don't tell her that I said this, a simple defense mechanism which involves purposefully exhibiting one strong primary emotion in an attempt to obfuscate the other more complex feelings she might be going through. Some kind of psychological flex to assert dominance in any given discussion. That seems like something to say. As the artist immensely enjoys discussions and, frankly, never shuts up. The critic looked over to the artist, who was busy in the kitchen preparing something. Cornflakes were pouring out to a bowl, though no milk was to be seen. The artist continued to pour the cereal until the bowl was full. Some flakes even started spilling out into the sink, all while she hummed some improvised tune with jolly care. The critic was then reminded of a promise they made shortly after this break started, which was that she would tell the artist an interesting story of which remembering it would help sort out your feelings about the dense range of emotions you are currently going through caused due to my sick-ass truth bomb. The critic was met with a dire dilemma. Unlike the artist, she never considered herself that much of a speaker. It's why she chose the written medium for her job after all. And even when writing, she never thought she was hardly any good at storytelling. She thought of herself as a boring person, with a boring profession that involves writing about what other people have already written. Even so, her online readers would often praise her for the narrative and artistic flair her articles would have. This troubled the critic, as she had never really thought about adding such things when writing, and even more so because she thinks she'd be bad at it if she were to try and do it intentionally so. It was a conflict that had troubled her ever since she started this writing career. Her gonzo style as her editor would put it, seemed to have naturally gravitated onto these broader narratives about art and about herself, even though she couldn't care less about those things. This must be why the artist was trying to get her to tell a story, the critic thought. She is trying to get to the bottom of this dilemma and to get her to use this subconscious talent of hers. So she closed her eyes, got lost in thought, and started thinking of a story. Even her headache had mysteriously vanished. Sounds of rain filled the room, and so had coldness. And when the air in the room was just cold enough, and the narrative humidity was just wet enough to the point of discomfort, Anna Han, the critic known as Han Anna online, started speaking up. It starts with the dumbest possible spark imaginable, really. Rejected at my first confession. 
boo fucking who. I remember what he told me. I just remembered it now, actually, and I'm realizing that it's pretty important. He said he didn't know me very much, and it's not like we were strangers too. We were in the same friend group and had lots of conversations together before. Later, I asked a lot of friends. I somehow had friends back then. Haven't had one of those since getting this job. And some of them were honest enough to tell me that they couldn't describe me as someone they know intimately either. In fact, they could not tell a single fact about what kind of person I was. These are people I thought I had a lot of kinship towards, but turns out I just wouldn't let them know anything about me. That was the problem. I was fucking obsessed with hiding who I was, and I know exactly why. And it's because I hate myself. Duh, no doubt about it. But this was the first time I realized that I had been doing this consciously, and that it was actually uh something bad for me. That this defense mechanism was only making myself alien to those around me. A few days after I got rejected, I was late for gym class, which I don't really go to anyways. No one minded, and I was in my classroom dozing out when I looked over to the guy's desk, and he had left his diary on his desk. Now, being the creepy fourteen-year-old I was, after a moment of self-reflection and swells of massive guilt, I read it, but I don't really remember what was in it. I do remember two facts: one, he had never written about me. Plenty about other girls, though. It didn't seem like he had anyone he liked. <sighs> It's just fucking nauseating, even reminiscing about this. I can't help but groan. Secondly, I learned a lot about this boy, despite me thinking I had known a lot about him already. Even basic shit like what kind of movies he liked, or funnily enough, how he would respond to a confession. It said he'd accept it in a heartbeat, no matter who it was. But I guess he was a fucking coward when it came down to it. Um, I guess I remember more than I thought I would. Han stood up to get a glass of water. She wasn't in the mood for coffee. There was strictly a work time drink. What Han saw over in the other side was the artist sitting on the floor and chowing down on raw cornflakes in this gluttonous form. Han hadn't even noticed the sound of chewing. God, the sound of chewing! The artist noticed Han's silence and looked up, smiling. She knows what she's doing. The artist was known as B. Rainer. She wouldn't tell Han her real name. Well, technically, it's not like it's her fake name either. Because there was this one time when B first moved in, she went off on this long spiel about names and how it is crucial to the formation of an identity. She talked about how choosing your own name should be more commonplace, as it's ridiculous that you hand off the responsibility of carving such an integral part of your identity to someone else. Han was having none of it and stopped her when she was about to go on about the origins of this pseudonym and its implications. Yeah, you should have been there for that one. It wasn't really the time for her to be doing something like this. The clock was striking 2 a.m. and B did have classes next morning. It was sort of odd that she came home so late in the first place. And while not exactly as well known as Han, she was a fairly well-established illustrator with a following. Not the time for an internet superstar, as she likes to call herself, to be doing something like this. Yet there she was, listening to a woman talk about a past memory forgotten since a decade ago, while eating cornflakes, looking like a dumbass. So. B put down her bowl on the floor instead of the table she could literally reach if she just crawled a little bit. What? Han grabbed a cup from the table. She went over to the sink and turned on the faucet, to which B reacted harshly. Hey, faucet water is not good for you. There are better ones in the fridge. What the hell? Who are you trying to be, my mother? What kind of situation is this right now? <laughs> 
I'll just get it for you, dude. We actually stood up and walked over to the refrigerator to grab an unopened bottle of water. She opened it, drank it herself from the bottle, then walked up to Han to hand it over. After Han looked at the tip of the bottle with a disgusting look, she then proceeded to wipe the tip with a tissue and poured it on the cup she was holding. So you were saying? We sat down on the floor again, looking up at Han. No, that was the end of the story. That can't be true, Doc. That was an excellent first act, but it's gotta lead into more. For example? You actually let's call her Anna. Realize her character flaw, and now she's aware of it. The obvious resolution that can follow this is for her to either fix it or find a way to circumvent it. This isn't a comic book. Uh, or what do you call those? Mangas? Hmm. B maintained her smile. It was an uncomfortable sight. It's literally my life. There's no such thing as character arcs in real life. The sight burned into Han's eyes, which made her turn around to a wall. Well, also remember what I told you at the beginning. I wanted you to find a story that explains why your writing is so personal, yet you do not like being that way. That is true, Han thought to herself, and her professional nature wouldn't let her promise go unfulfilled. She began to regret agreeing to this arrangement of contractual story time. She never liked thinking about her life, much less her past. But it did surprise and disturb her that she managed to remember so much about her first rejection. It was a sort of guilt that went through her veins, but also satisfaction at the same time. Satisfaction of an answer to questions she had buried inside of her all this time. Her memories jumped forward a few years later. It was there she found a crucial piece of the puzzle which had bypassed her until this point. Buried nostalgia steeped into her mind. She began reminiscing of her very first project as a critic, the beginnings of her lifestyle. Well, in high school, I wanted to join the newspapers club. But through some organizational mishap, I was instead given to the school magazine editing club. They didn't publish weekly papers, but instead spent the entire year to compile a book of student writings, such as articles or essays. It wasn't really where you went to write stuff, because, as the name suggests, it was more about compiling and editing all the stuff that students all around the school would submit. I mean, that's what I said, but it's high school. Wasn't even college yet. Kids don't really give a shit about making this good. I was one of like three editors too, and they were all seniors, sort of tired of this usual routine they go through each year. It's the club advising teacher who eventually has to do all the work. So this is what she told me. You can do anything with the writings you get. You can add or subtract anything from it. So it became a whole project for me. I don't know why I took up that mantle. I'm not the one to do another person's job. Maybe it was the fiery teenage spirit I used to have. And for some reason, I wanted to structure this book with some purpose. This is the only time I ever decided to write something with a narrative on purpose. Like I wanted its essay, its short story, its poem to lead it up to something. Most of the stuff I got was shit. I ended up writing about one third of the final published book myself. But I was still very picky of whatever I decided to throw in there. I hate to say it, but this experience is what I'd say was detrimental to my writing style now. I took a critical approach to everything I got, found its flaws, and added my own to use those flaws to my advantage. Each piece submitted was shaping my narrative in some way, by way of providing a creative input piece by piece. I do not remember what this story ended up being about. It ended up being that my original writings became the main narrative, while others became supplementary material that was still cohesive in tone and a theme too somewhat. 
I remember many poems and stories about romance, which I hadn't really been thinking of since that time in middle school. I also remember this is around the time my bipolar was getting pretty bad. I'd had my first manic episode the year before, on the senior year of middle school, that no one really noticed but looking back it was pretty obvious to me that it happened. I went through depressive episodes periodically the following years, and high school only made it worse, since I also lost a lot of confidence in my social skills since that breakdown in middle school. So yeah, it was a 16 year old girl trying to piece together all these different emotions by using other people's writings, mostly turning it into a transformative expression of her mental health. In the end, no one really got it. The advising teacher was the only one who read it through, I think, and she was just confused why I had written so much for it, since no student ever cared about this work until that point. Some of the students who submitted their stuff came up to me with varying responses. Some just asked why I changed so much. There was this one girl who was pretty mad about it though. Anyways, it's mostly parents who read this stuff to feel better about their money going to something more meaningful the students can do. So obviously, all they cared about was that their kid's name was on it. In the end, it didn't even matter. But uh, now that I remember it, things make sense now. I kinda wanna read it again. B started staring at Anna Han with an intentful look. It seemed to be a mixture of different expressions, a combination of the face you make when awestruck by the climax of a play, and the one you make when you have a eureka moment after finding the last clue of a mystery. Han had been looking at the wall the entire time, which apparently had the focus, but a little after finishing her story, she looked behind to find B with that ridiculously overdramatic face of hers. Han just thought, well, seen weirder reactions from this fucking girl before. She found her way to her work desk and sat down on her chair, the only place in the world that speaks comfort to her. That was when B stood up, performing a standing ovation. Wow, that was really good, Doc. Thanks. You can sit down again now. Man, I mean it. Uh, there was some resonating stuff right there. What was so resonating about it? It was a story of failure. A tale that got nowhere. That's not true. B shook her head. There is no such thing as a directionless story. Every tale leads to somewhere, if not a destination then a stopping point, if not the rest then a map, a lead. I can't see what was so telling about it. Han shrugged. Well I didn't realize you used to be so feisty. It's sort of adorable actually. B added a giggle on top of her smile. What? Han's face lit up. She started staring up at B's face. Imagine a 16 year old you sifting through papers and trying to concoct this masterpiece out of them. That's something I could imagine you doing. That's... Han raises a finger. An insult, right? And hey, I admire that. B proceeds to ignore Han's rhetorical question. I admire anyone willing to bite off more than they can chew. I could never do that. I never made a masterpiece. I've never even wanted to make one. I know. You are a talk. Han scoffed, not looking at B when doing so. She looks down at the floor. Yes, of course. I can talk all day. But I told you before, didn't I? It's just like breathing for me. You don't go out of your way to breathe the biggest breath you've taken. Or for that matter, intentionally sleep for the longest you've ever slept or eat as much as you can set your eyes on without a good reason. But unless under special circumstances, we only perform these actions that are vital to our survival for just that, just to keep us alive. That doesn't make sense. It feels good to sleep longer. It can be satisfying to eat a lot. Well, there is nothing making you do that though. It's not like once in every year or so that is mandatory to do. You could only do the bare minimum until the day you die. 
I only do the bare minimum because it is, and you hate me for saying this, what keeps me alive. Uh, I don't like what you're implying here. Han rolled her eyes. What am I implying? Another deceptive question. B knew perfectly well what she meant when she said before. She was in complete control of the conversation. That I write with a purpose? Do you believe that? B's eyes were half closed, giving off a sly look. She knows what she's doing. No, I do not believe I do. I haven't since that time in high school. I'm sure that's what drove me off from it. Then the question becomes, B went across the room to where the bed is. Why then? She jumped and sat on the top bunk where she commonly sleeps. Must there be a why? No, not necessarily. But you do have one. Your story let me confirm it. You might have been concealing it since that happened, but you still have it. I believe you do at least. Han once again turned around, this time to her right, to look at B again. If I'm being honest here, B was being quite manipulative during this whole exchange. But that was the sort of person she was. Someone very knowing of others, yet little of herself. She could see through everyone but her own self. And you can't blame her for that. Neither could you blame her for pushing on hand like this. It was said jokingly before, but opposites do attract, or so I think. You understand, don't you? It's not anyone's fault for who they are. The self simply beckons to them. It follows itself like chasing a dangling carrot or like the Ouroboros, like an actor in a stage. Then it perpetuates itself over and over again until you start to wonder when exactly did it start in the first place. I write because... Han's eyes widened, her pupils darkening deeper. In this one moment, it was like the world had become a blur. She held on to her chair. It was the only physical thing she could actually confirm was real right now. She wondered if she was having a panic attack. No, she could still breathe fine. She didn't have to call out for help yet. Would she be able to when that time comes though? She had never been successful. Not even once. Neither at calling out for help. Neither at her own assassination. That sort of stuff never went well for her. She tried using her nails to dig into the skin of her fingers. Not to confirm if she could feel pain or something cliche like that. She had always been able to numb everything out besides the pain. She simply wanted to check if there was a mark left on her skin. Something her mind can grasp onto. The silence was like an orchestral crescendo. Han continued to not continue her sentence. B looked out the window, which was right beside Han's desk. B would often sit on the bed like this, watching Han type away, unaware of B's observation. Han would sometimes grab the coffee mug on her left, or look to her right side where the window was and simply stare outside. There was quite a sturdy tall tree right outside their building. Leaves would often come and go, and both of them liked to watch the process happen, not realizing that each other were there for them. Hey, B broke the silence. Tell you what, I don't think your story was over yet, so let me finish it for you. You'll finish my story? Han raised her eyebrows. Yeah, could I do that? I mean, I feel like I've known you for a long time now, Doc. I'll try my best to stay true to the original while adding my own thoughts on it. It'd be more like a spiritual successor than a direct sequel. Is that fine for you? <sighs> there was an odd, out-of-character moment of hesitation for Han. I don't really care. Do uh, whatever you want. Han leaned back on her chair. She looked outside the window. The tree, devoid of any leaves because of the winter season, was being flooded from above by rain. Han sighed then looked up at the ceiling. The light was flickering. Her nerve had gotten pretty sensitive at this point. 
She wanted to suit it out and destroy it. It was a sort of sick, disturbing urge. She would get such violent desires whenever she was frustrated. Sometimes she wanted to throw a cup or even smash a monitor. She would never actually do that though. But instead, she closed her eyes, accepting the inevitable destiny she had arranged here this evening. Rain poured down and its rhythmic touches against the window filled the room with sound. And on the backdrop of that music, words started streaming out of B's mouth, just like flowing rain. Anna stepped into a puddle and saw a fuzzy reflection of herself. It pissed her off, so she instead looked up to a bright summer sky. It had rained yesterday, and the sun was shining brightly on her, like headlights spotlighting the actor on a stage. Yet she couldn't stand the sight, nor the sky, nor the sun. Later that day, she was listening to an English lecture in her university course. She couldn't really listen well, but, well, she knew how to pretend to. She looked over to her laptop, which was displaying her blog page. It had a half-written post on it. The brightness on the monitor was down at half percent, but she'd still look over sometimes without typing anything in. That was when a girl sitting next to her looked over, not at her but at the laptop, squinting her eyes to read it. Anna noticed this and loudly shut the laptop down, making a gigantic sound that echoed throughout the room with a soaring reverb that got everyone's attention, including the professor. Dozens, though to her, it seemed like hundreds of eyes were staring at her now. It was a spotlight even more blinding than that of the sun. She couldn't even muster out an apology. She couldn't do anything and they were just all there, staring at her, doing nothing else. It was only when this professor asked her, pardon me miss, that she reacted in any way. She stood up and went out the door in a frenzy. The girl who was sitting next to Anna had seen her face go pale. The girl decided that she needs to follow Anna to ask her something, and if not for an apology of her own. Anna, her vision awry, stumbled into the nearest bedroom. She locked herself in a star and found herself breathing uncontrollably. And it was only when she looked down that she saw her legs shaking, but everything else had become numb. So she tried biting her lips, which didn't feel like anything. She was then too afraid to bite her tongue, so she started scratching the skin of her arm, and it didn't work either. Her breath became increasingly frantic. Anna thought she was going to die. This was the irrational, unrealistic conclusion she had come to as she started weeping in that bathroom stall. It was the mixture of intense fear and cutting loneliness that she was experiencing at that time which led her to this logic. She obviously wasn't going to die, so it made no sense at all. But at that moment, even her brain started recognizing her condition as a legitimate threat of danger, and it made her heartbeat rise even faster. She kept mumbling, Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, to herself over and over again until her legs gave in. With the sound of a thump, she felt her body colliding with the toilet that woke her up from the panic for a short moment. In that moment of calm, she began recalling back to the scene before. All of the eyes, all of the silence, all of the lights. The fear she once had before started turning into fury. She wanted to gouge out every single eye that she could remember. Then she wanted to gouge her own eyes out, so she didn't have to look at them anymore. She clenched her fist and then banged it hard against the wall of the stall, letting out a similar echoing sound to which was heard when she closed her laptop. She repeated this motion, with the sound only growing louder, and the pain her muscles felt growing as well. She started letting out a moan every time her fist would connect with the wall, and over time, these moans would form screams. It became music and the music freed her. Every sound came to a stop when she heard another person's voice saying, Are you alright? 
It was sort of drowned out by the echo that was left induced, and the gasp that Anna let out shortly after. Um, so do you need help? The girl on the other side showed uneasiness in her voice. She seemed a little scared by Anna at this point. No, no, no. Anna cleared her throat, then raised her volume accordingly. I'm fine. That's not true. You can't possibly expect me to believe that. The girl seemed to have chuckled, but Anna couldn't exactly focus on her voice at the time. Come on, I'll take you to the nurse's office, dude. The girl grabbed the store's doorknob and turned it, producing no results in the process. No, Anna yelled. Her voice soared through the bathroom once again. What? The girl's patience increasingly began to grow thin. I want to be alone. Anna's voice was shrinking, now having been resorted to that of a whimper. I don't want to see anyone right now. Anna struggled to finish her words. What? Man, come on now. I can't see your eyes. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, uh, people's eyes scare me. Ah, uh, heck. Anna stood up and leaned over to the wall. She looked up at the ceiling and there was a light that was broken. She wished she could have been the one to break it. She wished she could do anything at all, but she did nothing. She was nothing. Hey man, look. I know the thing back there must have been pretty embarrassing. Wouldn't want that happening to me either. But you gotta understand that it happens pretty often. Let's get interrupted by Edith. The girl contemplated on her wording for a second. By her people a lot. And you know what? People forget about them the very moment the class is over. I mean, did you wanna be there too? No? Yeah, no one wanted to be. I didn't wanna be there. So I have to thank you for this, since I'm here instead. Like, people might have even been glad you interrupted that old fart. <laughs> Who knows? This is what I believe. That couldn't have happened. Well, I'm telling you this to make you feel better. I don't need you to make me feel better. I will feel better when you leave me alone. Darn. Do you believe that? The girl let out a groan and a sigh. Well then, see you later, Anna. Footsteps echoed throughout the bathroom, though they quickly declined in volume. Anna looked at her legs, but found that they were not shaking anymore. She could still hear her heartbeat ringing, but not as fast as before. She tried biting her lips, which was so much sensory input for her brain at this stage that she actually let out this high-pitched moan. She then proceeded to open the star and ran out the bedroom. On the other side of the hallway was a girl, presumably the girl from before, walking back to the classroom. Anna started running in the hallway, which was not good form, but her footsteps ringing over the hallway walls did catch the girl's attention, which made her look behind. Oh, the girl let out a sign of surprise. You, wait. Anna started gasping for breath. Yeah, I'm waiting. What's with the change of heart? Did you fall in love with me or something? In a dark and unkempt bedroom star? What? No! Anna shrieked. Uh, so what? I am here to demand an apology. From me? Oh yeah, I forgot. I wanted to do that too, but you know, you seemed pretty pissed off. The girl cleared her throat, then did a bunch of weird vocal exercising. She closed her eyes. Sorry for trying to look at your thing before. I didn't know you wrote. Now, thank you. You didn't have to know, and I didn't want anyone else to know. Why not? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know you, but you act like you know me. Oh, I don't need a dude. I just meant like you didn't seem like the type or something? What is that supposed to mean? Oh, uh, nothing. The girl started whistling, avoiding eye contact. She also started sweating. How old are you? Anna asked. I'm a freshman. I'm a senior. Wait, why were you in my class then? Um. The girl extended her speech, drawing it out as much as she could. Forget about that. What? So are you fine now? Yeah, yeah. Anna sighed. That happens sometimes. 
Yes, me too. Really? I mean, I have panic attacks too, dude. I think every college student in existence does. I don't know about that. Anna's legs started getting fidgety and she looked down at the floor. Looking at Anna, the girl then grabbed her arm and turned her around. Well, let's go back then, Anna. Wait. Anna shook off the girl's hand. What? Can we just, um, stay here instead? In this empty hallway? Just anywhere without people. Um... The girl looked around and then looked at Anna. They were finally making eye contact. Then she leaned over to some lockers, hands in her pocket. Ah, uh, I guess we could do that. Like I said, no one will really care. Yeah, thanks. They just stood together in silence. The girl would keep looking over to Anna, while Anna would just stare off into a wall somewhere. Sometimes the girl would try to start a conversation, but to no avail. Anna wouldn't answer anymore. They just started soaking in that moment after a while. Anna pulled out her phone then and started typing something. It was sort of like an impromptu diary. She felt she needed to record this down, but she didn't feel like having a conversation with this weird girl. So she, out of instinct, started using the only method she knew of. It was so natural, like stretching her hands. What's you doing? The girl looked over then asked. She didn't try to look at what was on the phone this time. Writing. This is all they said for that duration. Time passed quickly after that, with Anna never putting her phone down. And when the bell rang and students started coming out from doors, the girl came up to Anna, said this, then left on her own. You really don't let anyone see yourself. And as they say, that's all she wrote. B really did just say all of that from her mouth verbally. You could say it was a bit of fan fiction. Though from her perspective, it didn't really even feel like she did anything. She just followed the images in her head, given to her like a vision. Han had been staring at the window the entire time. For her, the rain was enough of a soundtrack for this story. B, after clearing her throat, lay down facing towards Han. The silence remained unbroken for some time, and Han hadn't even noticed it, so engrossed in the narrative at this point. Well, B spoke up. Well, oh, you are done? I didn't know. Were you even listening? Yeah, yeah, I was. Well then, what did you think? Uh, hey, you should consider a profession in writing. <laughs> I knew you'd love it. B clapped her hands, her body facing right up to the ceiling. She laughed and it sort of seemed like she cried too, but she was just out of breath. Her throat was dry too. She asked for Han to give her the water again, but Han was just sort of zoned out, still staring out the window, as if she had reached Jen. So the girl was you? Yup, my own little Mary Sue. <laughs> and that was me in my senior year, which never happened. Oh? B's face turned to that of surprise from Bright. That was just a funny coincidence then. I'm becoming a senior next year, so that's what came to my mind. I see. Well, it is funny, so haha. -ha. Han did her best to chuckle. Like I said, it's not that I simply added myself to your story. Anna was also me in some way. I could tell that. You were speaking from experience, weren't you? Just whatever imagery that came to my mind at that moment. But I can truly tell you that it did resonate with me. I believe in that. Oh, um... B looked around and also found herself staring at Han's expression. It was gloomy but also filled with a sort of worldliness. She had realized this was a woman who had probably been through a lot. She was attempting to get Han to explain herself, not only to bring Han closer, but also for her own selfish wants. She was starting to think perhaps she had been outplayed all this time. There is one thing I'm bummed about though, it's the ending. The ending? I feel like that story didn't have one. I know, right? Cause Anna's character arc is still in the present progressive form as we speak. 
I couldn't let her finish, you know. No, I don't know. Yes, you do. Huh? Han instinctively turned her head over to B, who was staring her down. You had all the clues. You even had the answers. But you didn't know the question yet. This is why I had to tell you. Which one? You said a lot. On why you're right. Why you must write. I told you that it didn't really be interrupted Han without thinking. What did Anna do when she was alienated from everyone? What did she do when the worst came to her? And what didn't she do when the best came for her? Why would she continue hurting herself, making others around her hurt as well in the process, all while being self-conscious about this fact too? Why did she write when her love died? And why did she write when passion bloomed life into her? And lastly, how is the only other friend she's made since becoming an adult just as fucked up as she is? What does that mean to you? What do you believe? Han looked down. She saw her foot tapping against the floor rhythmically. She also began to blink rhythmically as well. Not only that, but her breathing had gone into a machine-like state of order. One brain cell connected to one another. Something seemed to have died in her. And so it goes, then born again. It was a really shitty, lame moment of epiphany. There was a disgusting moment of nothingness until Han actualized her realization. Oh fuck, I think I write because I'm depressed. B didn't say anything back. At this moment she might have even felt the guilt. Was this the answer she had been trying to lead Han towards? Was it worth it? She just kept staring at Han. There was some resemblance of bitter sweetness on B's face. I mean, bipolar. You've told me about your condition before. B chose her words carefully from this point on, as there was no point in being brash now. If it's okay asking, when did you get diagnosed? 21. It was in my junior year of university. The same as you now. I dropped out shortly after. Yeah, you told me about this before. It's how I immediately figured out when I heard the story. That you got diagnosed so much later in life. Really? Yes. It's honestly so obvious, like when you mentioned having the manic episode. It all fit. I guess that was just part of my routine for me. The episodes, the haze, the blur. When I look through my memories throughout my entire life, it's been hiding itself all along. When I had finished processing it, which took a while, and it's the reason I dropped out. It had become almost friendly. I, for a brief moment, wondered maybe everyone else was messed up for not being like this. I get that. I couldn't imagine how other people live. How could you even be neurotypical, just living without this mental tumor? But I guess I've just been telling myself I'm fine like this, and I might actually be. I've never done anything so stupid that my life was in danger. Yeah, about that. I don't think I've ever caught you being manic or something. Uh, well, whenever I catch myself in it, I go outside. Or maybe it's that being outside triggers me to have an episode. I don't know. Han's body was starting to heat up. She got all hot and had to stand up and pace around the room. She touched her forehead but didn't really feel anything. She drew in a deep breath. Also, I don't get a long one anymore. Ever since getting a job, that is. But their intensity has gotten stronger. And... Han felt her headache coming back and had to clench her forehead. Fuck, man. Even I don't know what I'm like when I go manic. It's okay. You don't have to talk about it. I just remember, you know... Lots of writing, lots of talking, very, very loudly, drinking. What the hell? B expressed genuine concern. This came out of left field. I've never seen you drink. Well, when I feel like I've literally ascended to godhood because, oh my god, I got out of my room, I am now invincible, I suddenly have this desire to fuck my body up by filling it with toxic wastes and poisonous materials. Jesus, are you okay right now? 
No, I mean, it's like I try to prove to myself that I can't possibly feel like shit because the ecstasy and adrenaline is so fucking alien to my neurons that it numbs my senses along with reason or self-care. Too much input overrides my senses, but I guess my survival instincts don't die. I never got myself in actual trouble. Sometimes though I have nightmares of something like that happening. Han started knocking some stuff over on her table as her footsteps increased in pacing. B came down from the bed and tried to grab Han a hold, but Han just shook it off, not even aware that B was attempting to do this. Images and memories came rushing through her head, attempting to make sense of all this. All this shit. This must be why I have to use other people's art for my own. I have this innate fear of myself. Yes, I don't want anyone to know me. So even when I write, I have to blur and hide the message with all this bullshit. This is why I'm a critic, because I am afraid of criticism myself. So if no one knows anything about me, they can't criticize me at all. It's so stupid in a way. By letting myself do that, I have forgotten so much about myself as well. I have to recontextualize everything through other people's writings, their art. Because what do I have to go off of? Where's the art of what I do? I don't do anything. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Han looked like she was going to collapse to the floor any time now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, it's alright now. Okay. Han's legs finally gave in and as she started falling right on her face to the floor, B grabbed her and held her up. Then Han's arms naturally lost strength, but they had just enough power to hold on to B's back. It was a messy hug and perhaps not the most fitting given the situation, but Han just closed her eyes there, just like that. B reached for her back and began tapping it. It'll be, uh, fine. I'll make sure that happens. Yeah. 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 Between each word was a pause for breath. You wanna take a sour or something, dude? Yeah. B sat Han down in her chair. At this moment, her face was closed in on B. There wasn't anything coming out from her eyes. She wasn't making much noise either. Her breathing was fine. She just seemed completely out of it. Like her soul had momentarily been sucked out. But then again, it kept trying to come back because her expression never grew pale. She was still holding on to what alpha consciousness had been left in her. B leaned back then fell flat on the floor after that. B looked up to the ceiling and Han looked down at the floor. The two of them had this moment, together, just like in the fictional story B told. Just more silent, more understanding. It was impossible not to grasp at comparisons. But even though I say this, and most likely you had thought of this as well, they didn't really think about any of that. They weren't really thinking at all. Both of them were just being there for each other. They knew when to talk but also knew when to stay silent with one another. Their company, the other's very existence, comforted the two of them in their own way. Han and B's eyes met again. Han's expression was distinctly devoid of any feelings, and B was no longer smiling. Even though the usual signs were gone, they could still tell what each other was feeling. Hey, Han. Um, I know a doctor, a therapist. You want her number? Yes. Thank you. Rain leaked through and winter was coming. The atmosphere seemed to have been freezing the raindrops, turning outside into an early snow yard. Beyond the room's tiny rectangle window, you could almost see the aurora borealis brightening the room inside like a source of light.
so wrong It feels wrong just to even sing this song My dream became a day job Now my daily life is deception for the mom Where did go so wrong? It feels wrong just to even sing this song My dream became a day job Now my daily life is deception for the mom I sleep the light down All of life is just a space Inception ain't too sick, but my relations same as big This inception of regulations might have already been But I cannot help but hold on, boom I should embold on Stand up, takes his heart out, guess I still got them Tell me how they feel, tell me how they feel Keep to one sphere, keep to one sphere Pain to make sense, victims start just the same Don't quite help how the system, the way the masses listen I'm the only one staying up, can barely show them should fault Guess I'm the only one that's fucked I'm the one that's right, I'm the one that's right Can bet to see a price, so I see that other light Don't just spot the fight, don't just spot the fight Okay, so lonely life, it's a subject, it's a subject